The Spanish conquest of Yucatán was the campaign undertaken by the Spanish conquistadores against the late post-classic Maya states and polities in the Yucatán Peninsula, a vast limestone plain covering southeastern Mexico, northern Guatemala, and all of Belize. The Spanish conquest of the Yucatán Peninsula was hindered by its politically fragmented state. The Spanish engaged in a strategy of concentrating native populations in newly founded colonial towns. Native resistance to the new nucleated settlements took the form of the flight into inaccessible regions such as the forest or joining neighboring Maya groups that had not yet submitted to the Spanish. Among the Maya, ambush was a favored tactic. Spanish weaponry included broadswords, rapiers, lances, pikes, halberds, crossbows, matchlocks and light artillery. Maya warriors fought with flint-tipped spears, bows and arrows and stones, and wore padded cotton armor to protect themselves. The Spanish introduced a number of Old World diseases previously unknown in the Americas, initiating devastating plagues that swept through the native populations. The first encounter with the Yucatec Maya may have occurred in 1502, when the fourth voyage of Christopher Columbus came across a large trading canoe off Honduras. In 1511, Spanish survivors of the shipwrecked caravel called Santa Maria de la Barca sought refuge among native groups along the eastern coast of the peninsula. Hernán Cortés made contact with two survivors, Geronimo de Aguilar and Gonzalo Guerrero, six years later. In 1517, Francisco Hernández de Córdoba made landfall on the tip of the peninsula. His expedition continued along the coast and suffered heavy losses in a pitched battle at Champotan, forcing a retreat to Cuba. Juan de Grijalva explored the coast in 1518, and heard tales of the wealthy Aztec Empire further west. As a result of these rumors, Hernán Cortés set sail with another fleet. From Cozumel he continued around the peninsula to Tabasco where he fought a battle at Potonchan. From there Cortés continued onward to conquer the Aztec Empire. In 1524, Cortés led a sizable expedition to Honduras, cutting across southern Campeche, and through Petén in what is now northern Guatemala. In 1527 Francisco de Montejo set sail from Spain with a small fleet. He left garrisons on the east coast, and subjugated the northeast of the peninsula. Montejo then returned to the east to find his garrisons had almost been eliminated. He used a supply ship to explore southwards before looping back around the entire peninsula to central Mexico. Montejo pacified Tabasco with the aid of his son, also named Francisco de Montejo. In 1531 the Spanish moved their base of operations to Campeche, where they repulsed a significant Maya attack. After this battle, the Spanish founded a town at Chichen Itza in the north. Montejo carved up the province amongst his soldiers. In mid-1533 the local Maya rebelled and laid siege to the small Spanish garrison, which was forced to flee. Towards the end of 1534, or the beginning of 1535, the Spanish retreated from Campeche to Veracruz. In 1535, peaceful attempts by the Franciscan order to incorporate Yucatán into the Spanish Empire failed after a renewed Spanish military presence at Champotan forced the friars out. Champotan was by now the last Spanish outpost in Yucatán, isolated among a hostile population. In 1541-42 the first permanent Spanish town councils in the entire peninsula were founded at Campeche and Mérida. When the powerful Lord of Mani converted to the Roman Catholic religion, his submission to Spain and conversion to Christianity encouraged the lords of the western provinces to accept Spanish rule. In late 1546 an alliance of eastern provinces launched an unsuccessful uprising against the Spanish. The eastern Maya were defeated in a single battle, which marked the final conquest of the northern portion of the Yucatán Peninsula. The polities of Petén in the south remained independent and received many refugees fleeing from Spanish jurisdiction. In 1618 and in 1619 two unsuccessful Franciscan missions attempted the peaceful conversion of the still pagan Itza. In 1622 the Itza slaughtered two Spanish parties trying to reach their capital Nojpetén. These events ended all Spanish attempts to contact the Itza until 1695. Over the course of 1695 and 1696 a number of Spanish expeditions attempted to reach Nojpetén from the mutually independent Spanish colonies in Yucatán and Guatemala. In early 1695 the Spanish began to build a road from Campeche south towards Petén and activity intensified, sometimes with significant losses on the part of the Spanish. 
Martin de Urzua y Arizmendi, governor of Yucatan, launched an assault upon Nojpetan in March 1697. The city fell after a brief battle. With the defeat of the Itza, the last independent and unconquered native kingdom in the Americas fell to the Spanish. Geography <inaudible> 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 The Yucatán Peninsula is bordered by the Caribbean Sea to the east and by the Gulf of Mexico to the north and west. It can be delimited by a line running from the Laguna de Terminos on the Gulf Coast through to the Gulf of Honduras on the Caribbean coast. It incorporates the modern Mexican states of Yucatán, Quintana Roo and Campeche, the eastern portion of the state of Tabasco, most of the Guatemalan department of Petén, and all of Belize. Most of the peninsula is formed by a vast plain with few hills or mountains and a generally low coastline. A 15-kilometre stretch of high, rocky coast runs south from the city of Campeche on the Gulf Coast. A number of bays are situated along the east coast of the peninsula, from north to south they are Ascension Bay, Espiritu Santo Bay, Chetamal Bay and Amadique Bay. The north coast features a wide, sandy littoral zone. The extreme north of the peninsula, roughly corresponding to Yucatan state, has underlying bedrock consisting of flat Cenozoic limestone. To the south of this the limestone rises to form the low chain of Puuc hills, with a steep initial scarp running 160 km 99 miles east from the Gulf Coast near Champatan, terminating some 50 km 31 miles from the Caribbean coast near the border of Quintana Roo. The hills reach a maximum altitude of 170 meters (560 feet). The northwestern and northern portions of the Yucatan Peninsula experience lower rainfall than the rest of the peninsula. These regions feature highly porous limestone bedrock resulting in less surface water. This limestone geology results in most rainwater filtering directly through the bedrock to the phreatic zone, from whence it slowly flows to the coasts to form large submarine springs. Various freshwater springs rise along the coast to form watering holes. The filtering of rainwater through the limestone has caused the formation of extensive cave systems. These cave roofs are subject to collapse forming deep sinkholes. If the bottom of the cave is deeper than the groundwater level then a cenote is formed. In contrast, the northeastern portion of the peninsula is characterized by forested swamplands. The northern portion of the peninsula lacks rivers, except for the Champatan River, all other rivers are located in the south. The Sibin River flows from west to east from south-central Quintana Roo to Lake Bacalar on the Caribbean coast, the Rio Hondo flows northwards from Belize to empty into the same lake. Bacalar Lake empties into Chetamal Bay. The Rio Nuevo flows from Lamanai Lake in Belize northwards to Chetamal Bay. The Mopan River and the Macau River flow through Belize and join to form the Belize River, which empties into the Caribbean Sea. In the southwest of the peninsula, the San Pedro River, the Candelaria River and the Mamontel River, which all form a part of the Gulf of Mexico drainage, the Petén region consists of densely forested low-lying limestone plain featuring karstic topography. The area is crossed by low east-west oriented ridges of Cenozoic limestone and is characterized by a variety of forest and soil types. Water sources include generally small rivers and low-lying seasonal swamps known as bajos. A chain of 14 lakes runs across the central drainage basin of Petén. During the rainy season, some of these lakes become interconnected. This drainage area measures approximately 100 kilometers (62 miles) east-west by 30 kilometers (19 miles) north-south. The largest lake is Lake Petén Itza, near the center of the drainage basin. It measures 32 by 5 kilometers, 19.9 by 3.1 miles. A broad savanna extends south of the central lakes. To the north of the lakes region, bajos become more frequent, interspersed with forest. In the far north of Petén, the Mirador basin forms another interior drainage region. To the south, the plain gradually rises towards the Guatemalan highlands. The canopy height of the forest gradually decreases from Petén northwards, averaging from 25 to 35 meters (82 to 115 feet). This dense forest covers northern Petén and Belize, most of Quintana Roo, southern Campeche, and a portion of the south of Yucatán State. Further north, the vegetation turns to lower forest consisting of dense scrub. Topic: <laughs> Climate. The climate becomes progressively drier towards the north of the peninsula. In the north, the annual mean temperature is 27 degrees Celsius 81 degrees Fahrenheit in Mérida. 
Average temperature in the peninsula varies from 24 degrees Celsius 75 degrees Fahrenheit in January to 29 degrees Celsius 84 degrees Fahrenheit in July. The lowest temperature on record is 6 degrees Celsius 43 degrees Fahrenheit. For the peninsula as a whole, the mean annual precipitation is 1,100 mm The rainy season lasts from June to September, while the dry season runs from October to May. During the dry season, rainfall averages 300 mm in. in the wet season this increases to an average 800 to 900 mm The prevailing winds are easterly and have created an east-west precipitation gradient with average rainfall in the east exceeding 1,400 mm in, and the north and northwestern portions of the peninsula receiving a maximum of 800 mm the southeastern portion of the peninsula has a tropical rainy climate with a short dry season in winter. Petén has a hot climate and receives the highest rainfall in all Mesoamerica. The climate is divided into wet and dry seasons, with the rainy season lasting from June to December, although these seasons are not clearly defined in the south, with rain occurring through most of the year. The climate of Petén varies from tropical in the south to semi-tropical in the north. Temperature varies between 12 and 40 degrees Celsius (54 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit), although it does not usually drop beneath 18 degrees Celsius (64 degrees Fahrenheit). Mean temperature varies from 24.3 degrees Celsius (75.7 degrees Fahrenheit) in the southeast to 26.9 degrees Celsius (80.4 degrees Fahrenheit) in the northeast. Highest temperatures are reached from April to June, while January is the coldest month. All Petén experiences a hot dry period in late August. Annual precipitation is high, varying from a mean of 1198 mm (47.2 in) in the northeast to 2007 mm (79.0 in) in central Petén. Topic: <laughs> Yucatan before the conquest. The first large Maya cities developed in the Petén Basin in the far south of the Yucatán Peninsula as far back as the Middle Preclassic c. 600–350 BC, and Petén formed the heartland of the ancient Maya civilization during the Classic period c. AD 250–900. The 16th-century Maya provinces of northern Yucatán are likely to have evolved out of polities of the Maya Classic period. From the mid-13th century AD through to the mid-15th century, the League of Mayapan united several of the northern provinces, for a time they shared a joint form of government. The great cities that dominated Petén had fallen into ruin by the beginning of the 10th century AD with the onset of the classic Maya collapse. A significant Maya presence remained in Petén into the post-classic period after the abandonment of the major classic period cities. The population was particularly concentrated near permanent water sources in the early 16th century when the Spanish discovered the Yucatán Peninsula. The region was still dominated by the Maya civilization. It was divided into a number of independent provinces referred to as Cuchcabal, plural Cuchcabalub in the Yucatec Maya language. The various provinces shared a common culture but the internal socio-political organization varied from one province to the next, as did access to important resources. These differences in political and economic makeup often led to hostilities between the provinces. The politically fragmented state of the Yucatán Peninsula at the time of conquest hindered the Spanish invasion, since there was no central political authority to be overthrown. However, the Spanish were also able to exploit this fragmentation by taking advantage of pre-existing rivalries between polities. Estimates of the number of Kuchkabal in the northern Yucatán vary from 16 to 24. The boundaries between polities were not stable, being subject to the effects of alliances and wars. Those Kuchkabalub with more centralized forms of government were likely to have had more stable boundaries than those of loose confederations of provinces. When the Spanish discovered Yucatán, the provinces of Mani and Sotuta were two of the most important polities in the region. They were mutually hostile, the Shu Maya of Mani allied themselves with the Spanish, while the Kokam Maya of Sotuta became the implacable enemies of the European colonizers. At the time of conquest, polities in the north included Mani, Sipesh and Shakan. Shakan was largely landlocked with a small stretch of coast on the north of the peninsula. Sipesh was a coastal province to its east, further east along the north coast were Akin Chel, Kapul, and Chikinchal. The modern city of Valladolid is situated upon the site of the former capital of Kapul. 
Kapul and Chinkinshal are known to have been mutually hostile, and to have engaged in wars to control the salt beds of the north coast. Tazes was a small landlocked province south of Chikinchal. Ikab was a large province in the east. Uamal was in the southeast, and Chetamal was to the south of it, all three bordered on the Caribbean Sea. Cochua was also in the eastern half of the peninsula, it was southwest of Ikab and northwest of Uamal. Its borders are poorly understood and it may have been landlocked, or have extended to occupy a portion of the Caribbean coast between the latter two Kuchkabalub. The capital of Cochua was Tihosuko. Hokaba and Sotuta were landlocked provinces north of Mani and southwest of Akin Chel and Kapul. Akanal was the northernmost province on the Gulf Coast of the peninsula. Kanpesh modern Kampeche was to the south of it, followed by Chanputan modern Champotan. South of Chanputan, and extending west along the Gulf Coast was Akalan. This Chantal Maya speaking province extended east of the Usumacinta River in Tabasco, as far as what is now the southern portion of Campeche State, where their capital was located. In the southern portion of the peninsula, a number of polities occupied the Petan Basin. The Kejash occupied a territory to the north of the Itza and east of Akalan, between the Petan Lakes and what is now Campeche, and to the west of Chetamal. The Cholan Maya speaking Lacandon not to be confused with the modern inhabitants of Chiapas by that name controlled territory along the tributaries of the Usumacinta River spanning southwestern Petén in Guatemala and eastern Chiapas. The Lacandon had a fierce reputation amongst the Spanish, although there is insufficient data to accurately estimate population sizes at the time of contact with the Spanish. Early Spanish reports suggest that sizable Maya populations existed in Petén, particularly around the central lakes and along the rivers. Before their defeat in 1697 the Itza controlled or influenced much of Petén and parts of Belize. The Itza were warlike, and their martial prowess impressed both neighboring Maya kingdoms and their Spanish enemies. Their capital was Nojpetén, an island city upon Lake Petén Itza. It has developed into the modern town of Flores, which is the capital of the Petén Department of Guatemala. The Itza spoke a variety of Yucatecan Maya. The Covoy were the second in importance, they were hostile towards their Itza neighbors. The Kovoy were located to the east of the Itza, around the eastern Petén Lakes, Lake Salpetén, Lake Makanche, Lake Yaja and Lake Saknab. The Yalan appear to have been one of the three dominant polities in post-classic central Petén, alongside the Itza and the Kovoy. The Yalan territory had its maximum extension from the east shore of Lake Petén Itza eastwards to Tipuj in Belize. In the 17th century the Yalan capital was located at the site of that name on the north shore of Lake Makanche. At the time of Spanish contact the Yalan were allied with the Itza, an alliance cemented by intermarriage between the elites of both groups. In the late 17th century, Spanish colonial records document hostilities between Maya groups in the lakes region, with the incursion of the Covoy into former Yalan sites including Zacpetan on Lake Macanche and Ixlu on Lake Salpetan. Other groups in Petén are less well known, and their precise territorial extent and political makeup remains obscure. Among them were the Chinamita, the Ikesh, the Kejash, the Lacandon Chaal, the Manch Chaal, and the Mopan. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Impact of Old World Diseases. A single soldier arriving in Mexico in 1520 was carrying smallpox and thus initiated the devastating plagues that swept through the native populations of the Americas. The European diseases that ravaged the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas also severely affected the various Maya groups of the entire Yucatán Peninsula. Modern estimates of native population decline vary from 75% to 90% mortality. The terrible plagues that swept the peninsula were recorded in Yucatec Maya written histories, which combined with those of neighboring Maya peoples in the Guatemalan highlands, suggest that smallpox was rapidly transmitted throughout the Maya area the same year that it arrived in central Mexico with the forces under the command of Panfilo Narvaez. Old world diseases are often mentioned only briefly in indigenous accounts, making it difficult to identify the exact culprit. Among the most deadly were the aforementioned smallpox, influenza, measles and a number of pulmonary diseases, including tuberculosis. The latter disease was attributed to the arrival of the Spanish by the Maya inhabitants of Yucatán. These diseases swept through Yucatán in the 1520s and 1530s, with periodic recurrences throughout the 16th century. By the late 16th century, the reports of high fevers suggest the arrival of malaria in the region, and yellow fever was first reported in the mid-17th century, with a terse mention in the Chilam Balam of Chumayal for 1648. 
That particular outbreak was traced back to the island of Guadeloupe in the Caribbean, from whence it was introduced to the port city of Campeche, and from there was transmitted to Mérida. Mortality was high, with approximately 50% of the population of some Yucatec Maya settlements being wiped out. Sixteen Franciscan friars are reported to have died in Mérida, probably the majority of the Franciscans based there at the time, and who had probably numbered not much more than twenty before the outbreak. Those areas of the peninsula that experienced damper conditions, particularly those possessing swamplands, became rapidly depopulated after the conquest with the introduction of malaria and other waterborne parasites. An example was the one-time well-populated province of Ikab occupying the northeastern portion of the peninsula. In 1528, when Francisco de Montejo occupied the town of Canil for two months, the Spanish recorded approximately 5,000 houses in the town. The adult male population at the time has been conservatively estimated as 3,000. By 1549, Spanish records show that only 80 tributaries were registered to be taxed, indicating a population drop in Canil of more than 90% in 21 years. The native population of the northeastern portion of the peninsula was almost completely eliminated within 50 years of the conquest. In the south, conditions conducive to the spread of malaria existed throughout Petén and Belize. At the time of the fall of Nojpetén in 1697, there are estimated to have been 60,000 Maya living around Lake Petén Itza, including a large number of refugees from other areas. It is estimated that 88% of them died during the first ten years of colonial rule owing to a combination of disease and war. Likewise, in Tabasco the population of approximately 30,000 was reduced by an estimated 90%, with measles, smallpox, catars, dysentery and fevers being the main culprits. Topic. Weaponry, strategies and tactics The Spanish engaged in a strategy of concentrating native populations in newly founded colonial towns, or reducciones also known as congregaciones. Native resistance to the new nucleated settlements took the form of the flight of the indigenous inhabitants into inaccessible regions such as the forest or joining neighboring Maya groups that had not yet submitted to the Spanish. Those that remained behind in the reducciones often fell victim to contagious diseases. An example of the effect on populations of this strategy is the province of Akalin, which occupied an area spanning southern Campeche and eastern Tabasco. When Hernán Cortés passed through Akalin in 1525 he estimated the population size as at least 10,000. In 1553 the population was recorded at around 4,000. In 1557 the population was forcibly moved to Tichel on the Gulf Coast, so as to be more easily accessible to the Spanish authorities. In 1561 the Spanish recorded only 250 tribute-paying inhabitants of Tichel, which probably had a total population of about 1,100. This indicates a 90% drop in population over a 36-year span. Some of the inhabitants had fled Tichel for the forest, while others had succumbed to disease, malnutrition and inadequate housing in the Spanish reducción. Coastal reducciones, while convenient for Spanish administration, were vulnerable to pirate attacks. In the case of Tichel, pirate attacks and contagious European diseases led to the eradication of the reduccion town and the extinction of the Chantal Maya of Campeche. Among the Maya, ambush was a favored tactic. <laughs> <laughs> Spanish weaponry and armor The 16th-century Spanish conquistadors were armed with broadswords, rapiers, crossbows, matchlocks and light artillery. Mounted conquistadors were armed with a 3.7 meters 12 feet lance, that also served as a pike for infantrymen. A variety of halberds and bills were also employed. As well as the one-handed broadsword, a 1.7 meters 5.5 feet long two-handed version was also used. Crossbows had 0.61 meters two feet arms stiffened with hardwoods, horn, bone and cane, and supplied with a stirrup to facilitate drawing the string with a crank and pulley. Crossbows were easier to maintain than matchlocks, especially in the humid tropical climate of the Caribbean region that included much of the Yucatan Peninsula. <laughs> Native weaponry and armor Maya warriors entered battle against the Spanish with flint-tipped spears, bows and arrows and stones. They wore padded cotton armor to protect themselves. 
Members of the Maya aristocracy wore quilted cotton armor, and some warriors of lesser rank wore twisted rolls of cotton wrapped around their bodies. Warriors bore wooden or animal hide shields decorated with feathers and animal skins. <laughs> First encounters, 1502 and 1511 On 30 July 1502, during his fourth voyage, Christopher Columbus arrived at Guanaja, one of the Bay Islands off the coast of Honduras. He sent his brother Bartholomew to scout the island. As Bartholomew explored the island with two boats, a large canoe approached from the west, apparently en route to the island. The canoe was carved from one large tree trunk and was powered by 25 naked rowers. Curious as to the visitors, Bartholomew Columbus seized and boarded it. He found it was a Maya trading canoe from Yucatan, carrying well-dressed Maya and a rich cargo that included ceramics, cotton textiles, yellow stone axes, flint-studded war clubs, copper axes and bells, and cacao. Also among the cargo were a small number of women and children, probably destined to be sold as slaves, as were a number of the rowers. The Europeans looted whatever took their interest from amongst the cargo and seized the elderly Maya captain to serve as an interpreter. The canoe was then allowed to continue on its way. This was the first recorded contact between Europeans and the Maya. It is likely that news of the piratical strangers in the Caribbean passed along the Maya trade routes. The first prophecies of bearded invaders sent by Kukulkan, the northern Maya feathered serpent god, were probably recorded around this time, and in due course passed into the books of Chilam Balam. In 1511, the Spanish caravel Santa Maria de la Barca set sail along the Central American coast under the command of Pedro de Valdivia. The ship was sailing to Santo Domingo from Darien to inform the colonial authorities there of ongoing conflict between conquistadors Diego de Nicuesa and Vasco Núñez de Balboa in Darien. The ship foundered upon a reef known as Las Viboras, the Vipers, or, alternatively, Las Alacranes, the Scorpions, somewhere off Jamaica. There were just 20 survivors from the wreck, including Captain Valdivia, Geronimo de Aguilar and Gonzalo Guerrero. They set themselves adrift in one of the ship's boats, with bad oars and no sail. After thirteen days during which half of the survivors died, they made landfall upon the coast of Yucatan. There they were seized by Halak Uinic, a Maya lord. Captain Vildivia was sacrificed with four of his companions, and their flesh was served at a feast. Aguilar and Guerrero were held prisoner and fattened for killing, together with five or six of their shipmates. Aguilar and Guerrero managed to escape their captors and fled to a neighboring lord who was an enemy of Halak Uinic. He took them prisoner and kept them as slaves. After a time, Gonzalo Guerrero was passed as a slave to the Lord Nachin Khan of Chetamal. Guerrero became completely Mayanized and served his new lord with such loyalty that he was married to one of Nachin Chan's daughters, Zazil Ha, by whom he had three children. By 1514, Guerrero had achieved the rank of Nakam, a war leader who served against Nachin Chan's enemies. <inaudible> Francisco Hernández de Córdoba, 1517 In 1517, Francisco Hernández de Córdoba set sail from Cuba with a small fleet, consisting of two caravels and a brigantine, with the dual intention of exploration and of rounding up slaves. The experienced Anton de Alaminos served as pilot, he had previously served as pilot under Christopher Columbus on his final voyage. Also among the approximately 100 strong expedition members was Bernal Díaz del Castillo. The expedition sailed west from Cuba for three weeks, and weathered a two-day storm a week before sighting the coast of the northeastern tip of the Yucatán Peninsula. The ships could not put in close to the shore due to the shallowness of the coastal waters. However, they could see a Maya city some two leagues inland, upon a low hill. The Spanish called it Gran Cairo literally, Great Cairo, due to its size and its pyramids. Although the location is not now known with certainty, it is believed that this first sighting of Yucatan was at Isla Mujeres. The following morning, the Spanish sent the two ships with a shallower draft to find a safe approach through the shallows. The caravels anchored about one league from the shore. Ten large canoes powered by both sails and oars rowed out to meet the Spanish ships. Over thirty Maya boarded the vessels and mixed freely with the Spaniards. The Maya visitors accepted gifts of beads, and the leader indicated with signs that they would return to take the Spanish ashore the following day. The Maya leader returned the following day with twelve canoes, as promised. The Spanish could see from afar that the shore was packed with natives. 
The conquistadors put ashore in the brigantine and the ship's boats, a few of the more daring Spaniards boarded the native canoes. The Spanish named the headland Cape Catache, after some words spoken by the Maya leader, which sounded to the Spanish like Cones Catache. Once ashore, the Spaniards clustered loosely together and advanced towards the city along a path among low, scrub-covered hillocks. At this point the Maya leader gave a shout and the Spanish party was ambushed by Maya warriors armed with spears, bows and arrows, and stones. Thirteen Spaniards were injured by arrows in the first assault, but the conquistadors regrouped and repulsed the Maya attack. They advanced to a small plaza bordered by temples upon the outskirts of the city. When the Spaniards ransacked the temples they found a number of low-grade gold items, which filled them with enthusiasm. The expedition captured two Mayas to be used as interpreters and retreated to the ships. Over the following days the Spanish discovered that although the Maya arrows had struck with little force, the flint arrowheads tended to shatter on impact, causing infected wounds and a slow death. Two of the wounded Spaniards died from the arrow wounds inflicted in the ambush. Over the next 15 days the fleet slowly followed the coastline west, and then south. The casks brought from Cuba were leaking and the expedition was now running dangerously low on fresh water, the hunt for more became an overriding priority as the expedition advanced, and shore parties searching for water were left dangerously exposed because the ships could not pull close to the shore due to the shallows. On 23 February 1517, the day of St. Lazarus, another city was spotted and named San Lazaro by the Spanish, it is now known by its original Maya name, Campeche. A large contingent put ashore in the brigantine and the ship's boats to fill their water casks in a freshwater pool. They were approached by about 50 finely dressed and unarmed Indians while the water was being loaded into the boats, they questioned the Spaniards as to their purpose by means of signs. The Spanish party then accepted an invitation to enter the city. They were led amongst large buildings until they stood before a blood-caked altar, where many of the city's inhabitants crowded around. The Indians piled reeds before the visitors. This act was followed by a procession of armed Maya warriors in full war paint, followed by ten Maya priests. The Maya set fire to the reeds and indicated that the Spanish would be killed if they were not gone by the time the reeds had been consumed. The Spanish party withdrew in defensive formation to the shore and rapidly boarded their boats to retreat to the safety of the ships. The small fleet continued for six more days in fine weather, followed by four stormy days. By this time water was once again dangerously short. The ships spotted an inlet close to another city, Champotan, and a landing party discovered fresh water. Armed Maya warriors approached from the city while the water casks were being filled. Communication was once again attempted with signs. Night fell by the time the water casks had been filled and the attempts at communication concluded. In the darkness the Spaniards could hear the movements of large numbers of Maya warriors. They decided that a nighttime retreat would be too risky, instead, they posted guards and waited for dawn. At sunrise, the Spanish saw that they had been surrounded by a sizable army. The massed Maya warriors launched an assault with missiles, including arrows, darts and stones, they then charged into hand-to-hand -hand combat with spears and clubs. Eighty of the defenders were wounded in the initial barrage of missiles, and two Spaniards were captured in the frantic melee that followed. All of the Spanish party received wounds, including Hernández de Córdoba. The Spanish regrouped in a defensive formation and forced passage to the shore, where their discipline collapsed and a frantic scramble for the boats ensued, leaving the Spanish vulnerable to the pursuing Maya warriors who waded into the sea behind them. Most of the precious water casks were abandoned on the beach. When the surviving Spanish reached the safety of the ships, they realized that they had lost over 50 men, more than half their number. Five men died from their wounds in the following days. The battle had lasted only an hour, and the Spanish named the locale as the coast of the disastrous battle. They were now far from help and low on supplies, too many men had been lost and injured to sail all three ships back to Cuba. They decided to abandon their smallest ship, the Brigantine, although it was purchased on credit from Governor Velázquez of Cuba. The few men who had not been wounded because they were manning the ships during the battle were reinforced with three men who had suffered relatively minor wounds, they put ashore at a remote beach to dig for water. They found some and brought it back to the ships, although it sickened those who drank it. The two ships sailed through a storm for two days and nights, Alaminos, the pilot, then steered a course for Florida, where they found good drinking water, although they lost one man to the local Indians and another drank so much water that he died. 
The ships finally made port in Cuba, where Hernandez de Cordoba wrote a report to Governor Velázquez describing the voyage, the cities, the plantations, and, most importantly, the discovery of gold. Hernandez died soon after from his wounds. The two captured Maya survived the voyage to Cuba and were interrogated. They swore that there was abundant gold in Yucatan. Based upon Hernandez de Cordoba's report and the testimony of the interrogated Indian prisoners, Governor Velázquez wrote to the Council of the Indies notifying it of his discovery. Topic: Juan de Grijalva, 1518. Diego Velázquez, the governor of Cuba, was enthused by Hernández de Córdoba's report of gold in Yucatán. He organized a new expedition consisting of four ships and 260 men. He placed his nephew Juan de Grijalva in command. Francisco de Montejo, who would eventually conquer much of the peninsula, was captain of one of the ships, Pedro de Alvarado and Alonso de Vila captained the other ships. Bernal Díaz del Castillo served on the crew, he was able to secure a place on the expedition as a favor from the governor, who was his kinsman. Anton de Alaminos once again served as pilot. Governor Velázquez provided all four ships, in an attempt to protect his claim over the peninsula. The small fleet was stocked with crossbows, muskets, barter goods, salted pork and cassava bread. Grijalva also took one of the captured Indians from the Hernández expedition. The fleet left Cuba in April 1518, and made its first landfall upon the island of Cozumel, off the east coast of Yucatán. The Maya inhabitants of Cozumel fled the Spanish and would not respond to Grijalva's friendly overtures. The fleet sailed south from Cozumel, along the east coast of the peninsula. The Spanish spotted three large Maya cities along the coast, one of which was probably Tulum. On Ascension Thursday the fleet discovered a large bay, which the Spanish named Bahia de la Ascension. Grijalva did not land at any of these cities and turned back north from Ascension Bay. He looped around the north of the Yucatán Peninsula to sail down the west coast. At Campeche the Spanish tried to barter for water but the Maya refused, so Grijalva opened fire against the city with small cannon. The inhabitants fled, allowing the Spanish to take the abandoned city. Messages were sent with a few Maya who had been too slow to escape but the Maya remained hidden in the forest. The Spanish boarded their ships and continued along the coast, at Champotan, where the inhabitants had routed Hernandez and his men. The fleet was approached by a small number of large war canoes, but the ship's cannon soon put them to flight. At the mouth of the Tabasco River the Spanish sighted massed warriors and canoes but the natives did not approach. By means of interpreters, Grijalva indicated that he wished to trade and bartered wine and beads in exchange for food and other supplies. From the natives they received a few gold trinkets and news of the riches of the Aztec Empire to the west. The expedition continued far enough to confirm the reality of the gold-rich empire, sailing as far north as Panuco River. As the fleet returned to Cuba, the Spanish attacked Champotan to avenge the previous year's defeat of the Spanish expedition led by Hernández. One Spaniard was killed and fifty were wounded in the ensuing battle, including Grijalva. Grijalva put into the port of Havana five months after he had left. Topic. Hernán Cortés, 1519 Grijalva's return aroused great interest in Cuba, and Yucatán was believed to be a land of riches waiting to be plundered. A new expedition was organized, with a fleet of eleven ships carrying five hundred men and some horses. Hernán Cortés was placed in command, and his crew included officers that would become famous conquistadors, including Pedro de Alvarado, Cristóbal de Olid, Gonzalo de Sandoval and Diego de Ordaz. Also aboard were Francisco de Montejo and Bernal Díaz del Castillo, veterans of the Grijalva expedition. The fleet made its first landfall at Cozumel, and Cortés remained there for several days. Maya temples were cast down and a Christian cross was put up on one of them. At Cozumel, Cortés heard rumors of bearded men on the Yucatán mainland, who he presumed were Europeans. Cortés sent out messengers to them and was able to rescue the shipwrecked Geronimo de Aguilar, who had been enslaved by a Maya lord. Aguilar had learnt the Yucatec Maya language and became Cortés' interpreter. From Cozumel, the fleet looped around the north of the Yucatán Peninsula and followed the coast to the Tabasco River, which Cortés renamed as the Grijalva River in honor of the Spanish captain who had discovered it. In Tabasco, Cortés anchored his ships at Patanchan, a Chantal Maya town. 
The Maya prepared for battle but the Spanish horses and firearms quickly decided the outcome. The defeated Chandal Maya lords offered gold, food, clothing and a group of young women in tribute to the victors. Among these women was a young Maya noblewoman called Malinzin, who was given the Spanish name Marina. She spoke Maya and Nahuatl and became the means by which Cortés was able to communicate with the Aztecs. Marina became Cortés' consort and eventually bore him a son. From Tabasco, Cortés continued to Sempoala in Veracruz, a subject city of the Aztec Empire, and from there on to conquer the Aztecs. In 1519, Cortés sent the veteran Francisco de Montejo back to Spain with treasure for the king. While he was in Spain, Montejo pleaded Cortés' cause against the supporters of Diego de Velázquez. Montejo remained in Spain for seven years, and eventually succeeded in acquiring the hereditary military title of Adentado. <laughs> Hernán Cortés in the Maya Lowlands, 1524–25 In 1524, after the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire, Hernán Cortés led an expedition to Honduras over land, cutting across Acalán in southern Campeche and the Itza Kingdom in what is now the northern Petén department of Guatemala. His aim was to subdue the rebellious Cristóbal de Olid, whom he had sent to conquer Honduras. Olid had, however, set himself up independently on his arrival in that territory. Cortés left Tenochtitlan on 12 October 1524 with 140 Spanish soldiers, 93 of them mounted, 3,000 Mexican warriors, 150 horses, a herd of pigs, artillery, munitions and other supplies. He also had with him the captured Aztec Emperor Cuauhtémoc, and Cohuanacox and Tetlapanquetzal, the captive Aztec lords of Texcoco and Tlacopan. Cortés marched into Maya territory in Tabasco, the army crossed the Usumacinta River near Tenosique and crossed into the Chantal Maya province of Acalán, where he recruited 600 Chantal Maya carriers. In Acalán, Cortés believed that the captive Aztec lords were plotting against him and he ordered Cuauhtémoc and Tetlapanquetzal to be hanged. Cortés and his army left Acalán on 5 March 1525, the expedition passed onwards through Kejash territory and reported that the Kejash towns were situated in easily defensible locations and were often fortified. One of these was built on a rocky outcrop near a lake and a river that fed into it. The town was fortified with a wooden palisade and was surrounded by a moat. Cortés reported that the town of Tiac was even larger and was fortified with walls, watchtowers and earthworks. The town itself was divided into three individually fortified districts. Tiac was said to have been at war with the unnamed smaller town. The Kejash claimed that their towns were fortified against the attacks of their aggressive Itza neighbors. They arrived at the north shore of Lake Petén Itza on the 13th of March 1525. The Roman Catholic priests accompanying the expedition celebrated Mass in the presence of A.J. Khan Ek, the king of the Itza, who was said to be so impressed that he pledged to worship the cross and to destroy his idols. Cortés accepted an invitation from Khan Ek to visit Nojpetan also known as Teazal, and crossed to the Maya city with 20 Spanish soldiers while the rest of his army continued around the lake to meet him on the south shore. On his departure from Nojpetan, Cortés left behind a cross and a lame horse that the Itza treated as a deity, attempting to feed it poultry, meat and flowers, but the animal soon died. The Spanish did not officially contact the Itza again until the arrival of Franciscan priests in 1618, when Cortés' cross was said to still be standing at Nojpetan. From the lake, Cortés continued south along the western slopes of the Maya Mountains, a particularly arduous journey that took 12 days to cover 32 kilometers 20 miles, during which he lost more than two-thirds of his horses. When he came to a river swollen with the constant torrential rains that had been falling during the expedition, Cortés turned upstream to the Gracias a Dios Rapids, which took two days to cross and cost him more horses. On 15 April 1525 the expedition arrived at the Maya village of Tensis. With local guides they headed into the hills north of Lake Isabel, where their guides abandoned them to their fate. The expedition became lost in the hills and came close to starvation before they captured a Maya boy who led them to safety. Cortés found a village on the shore of Lake Isabel, perhaps Xocolo. He crossed the Dulce River to the settlement of Nito, somewhere on the Amadique Bay, with about a dozen companions, and waited there for the rest of his army to regroup over the next week. By this time the remnants of the expedition had been reduced to a few hundred. Cortés succeeded in contacting the Spaniards he was searching for, only to find that Cristóbal de Olid's own officers had already put down his rebellion. 
Cortés then returned to Mexico by sea. Francisco de Montejo, 1527–28 The richer lands of Mexico engaged the main attention of the conquistadors for some years, then in 1526 Francisco de Montejo a veteran of the Grijalva and Cortés expeditions successfully petitioned the King of Spain for the right to conquer Yucatán. On 8 December of that year he was issued with the hereditary military title of Adentado and permission to colonize the Yucatán Peninsula. In 1527, he left Spain with 400 men in four ships, with horses, small arms, cannon and provisions. He set sail for Santo Domingo, where more supplies and horses were collected, allowing Montejo to increase his cavalry to 50. One of the ships was left at Santo Domingo as a supply ship to provide later support, the other ships set sail and reached Cozumel in the second half of September 1527. Montejo was received in peace by the lord of Cozumel, A. J. Nam Pat, but the ships only stopped briefly before making for the Yucatán coast. The expedition made landfall somewhere near Zela in the Maya province of Icob, in what is now Mexico's Quintana Roo state. Montejo garrisoned Zela with 40 soldiers under his second in command, Alonso de Vila, and posted 20 more at nearby Pole. Zela was renamed Salamanca de Zela and became the first Spanish settlement on the peninsula. The provisions were soon exhausted and additional food was seized from the local Maya villagers, this too was soon consumed. Many local Maya fled into the forest and Spanish raiding parties scoured the surrounding area for food, finding little. With discontent growing among his men, Montejo took the drastic step of burning his ships, this strengthened the resolve of his troops, who gradually acclimatized to the harsh conditions of Yucatán. Montejo was able to get more food from the still-friendly A.J. Newham Pat, when the latter made a visit to the mainland. Montejo took 125 men and set out on an expedition to explore the northeastern portion of the Yucatán Peninsula. His expedition passed through the towns of Zamana, Mochis and Belma, none of which survives today. At Belma, Montejo gathered the leaders of the nearby Maya towns and ordered them to swear loyalty to the Spanish crown. After this, Montejo led his men to Canil, a town in Icob that was described as having 5,000 houses, where the Spanish party halted for two months. In the spring of 1528, Montejo left Canil for the city of Chauaca, which was abandoned by its Maya inhabitants under cover of darkness. The following morning, the inhabitants attacked the Spanish party but were defeated. The Spanish then continued to Ake, some 16 kilometers 9.9 .9 miles north of Tizimin, where they engaged in a major battle against the Maya, killing more than 1,200 of them. After this Spanish victory, the neighboring Maya leaders all surrendered. Montejo's party then continued to Sija and Loach before heading back to Zela. Montejo arrived at Zela with only 60 of his party, and found that only 12 of his 40 man garrison survived. While the garrison at Pole had been entirely wiped out, the support ship eventually arrived from Santo Domingo, and Montejo used it to sail south along the coast, while he sent to Vila overland. Montejo discovered the thriving port city of Choctamal. Modern Chetamal. At Choctamal, Montejo learnt that shipwrecked Spanish sailor Gonzalo de Guerrero was in the region, and Montejo sent messages to him, inviting him to return to join his compatriots, but the Mayanized Guerrero declined. The Maya at Choctamal fed false information to the Spanish, and Montejo was unable to find de Vila and link up with him. De Vila returned overland to Zela, and transferred the fledgling Spanish colony to nearby Zamana, modern Playa del Carmen, which Montejo considered to be a better port. After waiting for Davila without result, Montejo sailed south as far as the Alua River in Honduras before turning around and heading back up the coast to finally meet up with his lieutenant at Zamana. Late in 1528, Montejo left Davila to oversee Zamana and sailed north to loop around the Yucatán Peninsula and head for the Spanish colony of New Spain in central Mexico. Topic: <laughs> Francisco de Montejo and Alonso de Vila, 1531 to 35. Montejo was appointed alcalde mayor a local colonial governor of Tabasco in 1529, and pacified that province with the aid of his son, also named Francisco de Montejo. De Vila was sent from eastern Yucatán to conquer Acalan, which extended southeast of the Laguna de Terminos. Montejo the Younger founded Salamanca de Zicalango as a base of operations. In 1530 de Vila established Salamanca de Acalan as a base from which to launch new attempts to conquer Yucatán. 
Salamanca de Acalan proved a disappointment, with no gold for the taking and with lower levels of population than had been hoped. Davila soon abandoned the new settlement and set off across the lands of the Kejash to Champotan, arriving there towards the end of 1530. During a colonial power struggle in Tabasco, the elder Montejo was imprisoned for a time. Upon his release, he met up with his son in Zicalango, Tabasco, and they then both rejoined Davila at Champotan. In 1531, Montejo moved his base of operations to Campeche. Alonso de Vila was sent overland to Chauaca in the east of the peninsula, passing through Mani where he was well received by the Shumaya. De Vila continued southeast to Chetamal where he founded the Spanish town of Villa Real. Royal town. The local Maya fiercely resisted the placement of the new Spanish colony and de Vila and his men were forced to abandon Villa Real and make for Honduras in canoes. At Campeche, the Maya amassed a strong force and attacked the city. The Spanish were able to fight them off, a battle in which the elder Montejo was almost killed. A. J. Cannell, the lord of the attacking Maya, surrendered to the Spanish. After this battle, the younger Francisco de Montejo was dispatched to the northern Capul province, where the Lord Nabon Capul reluctantly allowed him to found the Spanish town of Ciudad Real at Chichen Itza. Montejo carved up the province amongst his soldiers and gave each of his men two to three thousand Maya in encomienda. After six months of Spanish rule, Capul dissatisfaction could no longer be contained and Nabon Capul was killed during a failed attempt to kill Montejo the younger. The death of their lord only served to inflame Capul anger and, in mid-1533, they laid siege to the small Spanish garrison at Chichen Itza. Montejo the Younger abandoned Ciudad Real by night after arranging a distraction for their attackers, and he and his men fled west, where the Chel, Peck and Shu provinces remained obedient to Spanish rule. Montejo the Younger was received in friendship by Namix Chel, the lord of the Chel province, at Zilam. In the spring of 1534 he rejoined his father in the Shakan province at Jikabal, near Taho the modern city of Merida, while his son had been attempting to consolidate the Spanish control of Capul, Francisco de Montejo the Elder had met the Shu ruler at Mani. The Shu Maya maintained their friendship with the Spanish throughout the conquest and Spanish authority was eventually established over Yucatan in large part due to Shu support. The Montejos, after reuniting at Jicabal, founded a new Spanish town at Zilam, although the Spanish suffered hardships there. Montejo the Elder returned to Campeche, where he was received with friendship by the local Maya. He was accompanied by the friendly Chel Lord Namix Chel, who traveled on horseback, and two of the Lord's cousins, who were taken in chains. Montejo the Younger remained behind in Zilam to continue his attempts at conquest of the region but, finding the situation too difficult, he soon retreated to Campeche to rejoin his father and Alonso de Vila, who had returned to Campeche shortly before Montejo the Younger. Around this time, the news began to arrive of Francisco Pizarro's conquests in Peru and the rich plunder that his soldiers were taking there, undermining the morale of Montejo's already disenchanted band of followers. Montejo's soldiers began to abandon him to seek their fortune elsewhere. In seven years of attempted conquest in the northern provinces of the Yucatan Peninsula, very little gold had been found. Towards the end of 1534 or the beginning of the next year, Montejo the Elder and his son retreated from Campeche to Veracruz, taking their remaining soldiers with them. Montejo the Elder became embroiled in colonial infighting over the right to rule Honduras, a claim that put him in conflict with Pedro de Alvarado, Captain General of Guatemala, who also claimed Honduras as part of his jurisdiction. Alvarado's claim ultimately turned out successful. In Montejo the Elder's absence, first in central Mexico, and then in Honduras, Montejo the Younger acted as lieutenant governor and captain general in Tabasco. Topic. Conflict at Champotan The Franciscan friar Jacobo de Testira arrived in Champotan in 1535 to attempt the peaceful incorporation of Yucatan into the Spanish Empire. Testira had been assured by the Spanish authorities that no military activity would be undertaken in Yucatan, while he was attempting its conversion to the Roman Catholic faith, and that no soldiers would be permitted to enter the peninsula. His initial efforts were proving successful when Captain Lorenzo de Godoy arrived in Champotan at the command of soldiers dispatched there by Montejo the Younger. Godoy and Testira were soon in conflict and the friar was forced to abandon Champotan and return to central Mexico. Godoy's attempt to subdue the Maya around Champotan was unsuccessful and the local Covoy Maya resisted his attempts to assert Spanish dominance of the region. 
This resistance was sufficiently tenacious that Montejo the Younger sent his cousin from Tabasco to Champotan to take command. His diplomatic overtures to the Champotan convoy were successful and they submitted to Spanish rule. Champotan was the last Spanish outpost in the Yucatan Peninsula, it was increasingly isolated and the situation there became difficult. Conquest and settlement in northern Yucatan, 1540–46 In 1540, Montejo the Elder, who was now in his late sixties, turned his royal rights to colonize Yucatan over to his son, Francisco de Montejo the Younger. In early 1541, Montejo the Younger joined his cousin in Champotan, he did not remain there long, and quickly moved his forces to Campeche. Once there, Montejo the Younger, commanding between three and four hundred Spanish soldiers, established the first permanent Spanish town council in the Yucatan Peninsula. Shortly after establishing the Spanish presence in Campeche, Montejo the Younger summoned the local Maya lords and commanded them to submit to the Spanish crown. A number of lords submitted peacefully, including the ruler of the Shu Maya. The Lord of the Canal Maya refused to submit and Montejo the Younger sent his cousin against them. Montejo himself remained in Campeche awaiting reinforcements. Montejo the Younger's cousin met the Canal Maya at Shakan, not far from Tejo. On 6 January 1542, he founded the second permanent town council, calling the new colonial town Merida. On 23 January, Tutal Shu, the Lord of Mani, approached the Spanish encampment at Merida in peace, bearing sorely needed food supplies. He expressed interest in the Spanish religion and witnessed a Roman Catholic Mass celebrated for his benefit. Tutal Shu was greatly impressed and converted to the new religion. He was baptized as Melcher and stayed with the Spanish at Merida for two months, receiving instruction in the Catholic faith. Tutal Shu was the ruler of the most powerful province of northern Yucatan and his submission to Spain and conversion to Christianity had repercussions throughout the peninsula, and encouraged the lords of the western provinces of the peninsula to accept Spanish rule. The eastern provinces continued to resist Spanish overtures. Montejo the Younger next sent his cousin to Chauaca where most of the eastern lords greeted him in peace. The Cochua Maya resisted fiercely but were soon defeated by the Spanish. The Capul Maya also rose up against the newly imposed Spanish domination, and also their opposition was quickly put down. Montejo continued to the eastern Ikab province, reaching the east coast at Pol. Stormy weather prevented the Spanish from crossing to Cozumel, and nine Spaniards drowned in the attempted crossing. Another Spanish conquistador was killed by hostile Maya. Rumors of this setback grew in the telling and both the Capul and Cochua provinces once again rose up against there would be European overlords. The Spanish hold on the eastern portion of the peninsula remained tenuous and a number of Maya polities remained independent, including Chetamal, Cochua, Capul, Sotuta and the Tezas. On 8 November 1546, an alliance of eastern provinces launched a coordinated uprising against the Spanish. The provinces of Capul, Cochua, Sotuta, Tezas, Uamal, Chetamal and Chicanchal united in a concerted effort to drive the invaders from the peninsula. The uprising lasted four months. Eighteen Spaniards were surprised in the eastern towns, and were sacrificed. A contemporary account described the slaughter of over 400 allied Maya, as well as livestock. Merida and Campeche were forewarned of the impending attack, Montejo the Younger and his cousin were in Campeche. Montejo the Elder arrived in Merida from Chiapas in December 1546, with reinforcements gathered from Champotan and Campeche. The rebellious eastern Maya were finally defeated in a single battle, in which 20 Spaniards and several hundred allied Maya were killed. This battle marked the final conquest of the northern portion of the Yucatan Peninsula. As a result of the uprising and the Spanish response, many of the Maya inhabitants of the eastern and southern territories fled to the still unconquered Petén Basin, in the extreme south of the peninsula. The Spanish only achieved dominance in the north and the polities of Petén remained independent and continued to receive many refugees from the north. <laughs> Petén Basin, 1618–97 The Petén Basin covers an area that is now part of Guatemala, in colonial times it originally fell under the jurisdiction of the governor of Yucatán, before being transferred to the jurisdiction of the Audiencia Real of Guatemala in 1703. The Itza kingdom centered upon Lake Petén Itza had been visited by Hernán Cortés on his march to Honduras in 1525. 
Topic: <laughs> Early 17th century. Following Cortés' visit, no Spanish attempted to visit the warlike Itza inhabitants of Nojpetan for almost a hundred years. In 1618 two Franciscan friars set out from Mérida on a mission to attempt the peaceful conversion of the still pagan Itza in central Petén. Bartolomé de Fuensalida and Juan de Orbita were accompanied by some Christianized Maya. After an arduous six-month journey the travelers were well received at Nojpetén by the current Kanak. They stayed for some days in an attempt to evangelize the Itza, but the A.J. Kanak refused to renounce his Maya religion, although he showed interest in the masses held by the Catholic missionaries. Attempts to convert the Itza failed, and the friars left Nojpetan on friendly terms with Kanak. The friars returned in October 1619, and again Kanak welcomed them in a friendly manner, but this time the Maya priesthood were hostile and the missionaries were expelled without food or water, but survived the journey back to Mérida. In March 1622, the governor of Yucatán, Diego de Cardenas, ordered Captain Francisco de Mirwans Lescano to launch an assault upon the Itza. He set out from Yucatán with 20 Spanish soldiers and 80 Mayas from Yucatán. His expedition was later joined by Franciscan friar Diego Delgado. In May the expedition advanced to Sacalum, southwest of Bacalar, where there was a lengthy delay while they waited for reinforcements. En route to Nojpetan, Delgado believed that the soldiers' treatment of the Maya was excessively cruel, and he left the expedition to make his own way to Nojpetan with 80 Christianized Maya from Tipuj in Belize. In the meantime the Itza had learned of the approaching military expedition and had become hardened against further Spanish missionary attempts. When Mirwans learned of Delgado's departure, he sent 13 soldiers to persuade him to return or continue as his escort should he refuse. The soldiers caught up with him just before Tipuj, but he was determined to reach Nojpetan. From Tipuj, Delgado sent a messenger to Khan Ek, asking permission to travel to Nojpetan. The Itza king replied with a promise of safe passage for the missionary and his companions. The party was initially received in peace at the Itza capital, but as soon as the Spanish soldiers let their guard down, the Itza seized and bound the new arrivals. The soldiers were sacrificed to the Maya gods. After their sacrifice, the Itza took Delgado, cut his heart out, and dismembered him. They displayed his head on a stake with the others. The fortune of the leader of Delgado's Maya companions was no better. With no word from Delgado's escort, Mirwan sent two Spanish soldiers with a Maya scout to learn their fate. When they arrived upon the shore of Lake Petén Itza, the Itza took them across to their island capital and imprisoned them. Bernardino Ek, the scout, escaped and returned to Mirwan's with the news. Soon afterwards, on 27 January 1624, an Itza war party led by Ikan Paal caught Mirwans and his soldiers off guard and unarmed in the church at Sakalam, and killed them all. Spanish reinforcements arrived too late. A number of local Maya men and women were killed by Spanish attackers, who also burned the town. Following these killings, Spanish garrisons were stationed in several towns in southern Yucatan, and rewards were offered for the whereabouts of Ikan Paal. The Maya governor of Oxcutscab, Fernando Kamal, set out with 150 Maya archers to track the warleader down. They succeeded in capturing the Itza captain and his followers, together with silverware from the looted Sakalam church and items belonging to Mirwans. The prisoners were taken back to the Spanish captain Antonio Mendez de Canzo, interrogated under torture, tried, and condemned to be hanged, drawn and quartered. They were decapitated, and the heads were displayed in the plazas of towns throughout the colonial Partido de la Sierra in what is now Mexico's Yucatán state. These events ended all Spanish attempts to contact the Itza until 1695. In the 1640s internal strife in Spain distracted the government from attempts to conquer unknown lands. The Spanish crown lacked the time, money or interest in such colonial adventures for the next four decades. Late 17th century In 1692 Basque nobleman Martín de Ursúa y Arizmendi proposed to the Spanish king the construction of a road from Mérida southwards to link with the Guatemalan colony, in the process, "...reducing any independent native populations into colonial congregaciones, this was part of a greater plan to subjugate the Lacandon and Manchchal of southern Petén and the upper reaches of the Usumacinta River. 
The original plan was for the province of Yucatán to build the northern section and for Guatemala to build the southern portion, with both meeting somewhere in Chaal territory. The plan was later modified to pass further east, through the Kingdom of the Itza. The governor of Yucatán, Martín de Ursúa y Arizmendi, began to build the road from Campeche south towards Petén. At the beginning of March 1695, Captain Alonso Garcia de Paredes led a group of 50 Spanish soldiers, accompanied by native guides, muleteers, and laborers. The expedition advanced south into Kejash territory, which began at Chunpich, about 5 kilometers (3.1 miles) north of the modern border between Mexico and Guatemala. He rounded up some natives to be moved into colonial settlements, but met with armed Kejash resistance. Garcia decided to retreat around the middle of April. In March 1695, Captain Juan Diaz de Velasco set out from Cajabon in Alta Verapaz, Guatemala, with 70 Spanish soldiers, accompanied by a large number of Maya archers from Verapaz, native muleteers, and four Dominican friars. The Spanish pressed ahead to Lake Petén Itza and engaged in a series of fierce skirmishes with Itza hunting parties. At the lakeshore, within sight of Nojpetan, the Spanish encountered such a large force of Itzas that they retreated south, back to their main camp. Interrogation of an Itza prisoner revealed that the Itza kingdom was in a state of high alert to repel the Spanish. The expedition almost immediately withdrew back to Cajabon. In mid May 1695, Garcia again marched southwards from Campeche, with 115 Spanish soldiers and 150 Maya musketeers, plus Maya laborers and muleteers. The final tally was more than 400 people, which was regarded as a considerable army in the impoverished Yucatan province. Ursua also ordered two companies of Maya musketeers from Tekix and Oxkutskab to join the expedition at Bolonchen Kawich, some 60 kilometers 37 miles southeast of the city of Campeche. At the end of May three friars were assigned to join the Spanish force, accompanied by a lay brother. A second group of Franciscans would continue onwards independently to Nojpetan to make contact with the Itzas. It was led by Friar Andrés de Avendaño, who was accompanied by another friar and a lay brother. Garcia ordered the construction of a fort at Chuntuki, some 25 leagues approximately 65 miles or 105 kilometers north of Lake Petén Itza, which would serve as the main military base for the Camino Real Royal Road project. The Sajkabachan company of native musketeers pushed ahead with the road builders from Sukzak to the first Kejash town at Chunpich, which the Kejash had fled. The company's officers sent for reinforcements from Garcia at Suktok, but before any could arrive some 25 Kejash returned to Chunpich with baskets to collect their abandoned food. The nervous Sajkabachan sentries feared that the residents were returning en masse and discharged their muskets at them, with both groups then retreating. The musketeer company then arrived to reinforce their sentries and charged into battle against approaching Kejash archers. Several musketeers were injured in the ensuing skirmish and, the Kejash retreated along a forest path without injury. The Sajkabachan company followed the path and found two more deserted settlements with large amounts of abandoned food. They seized the food and retreated back along the path. Around 3 August Garcia moved his entire army forward to Chunpich, and by October Spanish soldiers had established themselves near the source of the San Pedro River. By November Suktok was garrisoned with 86 soldiers and more at Chuntuki. In December 1695 the main force was reinforced with 250 soldiers, of which 150 were Spanish and Pardo and 100 were Maya, together with laborers and muleteers. <laughs> Avendaño's expedition, June 1695 In May 1695 Antonio de Silva had appointed two groups of Franciscans to head for Petén. The first group was to join up with Garcia's military expedition. The second group was to head for Lake Petén Itza independently. This second group was headed by Friar Andrés de Avendaño. Avendaño was accompanied by another friar, a lay brother, and six Christian Maya. This latter group left Mérida on 2 June 1695. Avendaño continued south along the course of the new road, finding increasing evidence of Spanish military activity. The Franciscans overtook Garcia at Biucta, about 12 kilometers (7.5 miles) before Suktok. On the 3rd of August, Garcia advanced to Chunpich but tried to persuade Avendaño to stay behind to minister to the prisoners from Biucta. Avendaño instead split his group and left in secret with just four Christian Maya companions, seeking the Chunpich Kejash that had attacked one of Garcia's advance companies and had now retreated into the forest. 
He was unable to find the Kejash but did manage to get information regarding a path that led southwards to the Itza kingdom. Avendano returned to Suktok and reconsidered his plans, the Franciscans were short of supplies, and the forcefully congregated Maya that they were charged with converting were disappearing back into the forest daily. Antonio de Silva ordered Avendano to return to Mérida, and he arrived there on 17 September 1695. Meanwhile, the other group of Franciscans, led by Juan de San Buenaventura Chavez, continued following the roadbuilders into Kejash territory, through Ixbam, Ba'utkab and Chuntuki modern Chuntunki near Carmelita, Petén. <laughs> San Buenaventura among the Kejash, September–November 1695 Juan de San Buenaventura's small group of Franciscans arrived in Chuntuki on 30 August 1695, and found that the army had opened the road southwards for another 17 leagues approximately 44.2 miles or 71.1 kilometers, almost halfway to Lake Petén Itza, but returned to Chuntuki due to the seasonal rains. San Buenaventura was accompanied by two friars and a lay brother. With Avendaño's return to Mérida, provincial superior Antonio de Silva dispatched two additional friars to join San Buenaventura's group. One of these was to convert the Kejash in Suktok, and the other was to do the same at Chuntuki. On 24 October San Buenaventura wrote to the provincial superior reporting that the warlike Kejash were now pacified and that they had told him that the Itza were ready to receive the Spanish in friendship. On that day 62 Kejash men had voluntarily come to Chuntuki from Pakakam, where another 300 Kejash resided. In early November 1695, Friar Tomás de Alcozer and brother Lucas de San Francisco were sent to establish a mission at Pakakam, where they were well received by the cacique native chief and his pagan priest. Pakakam was sufficiently far from the new Spanish road that it was free from military interference, and the friars oversaw the building of a church in what was the largest mission town in Kejash territory. A second church was built at Ba'utkab to attend to over 100 Kejash refugees who had been gathered there under the stewardship of a Spanish friar. A further church was established at Suktok, overseen by another friar. Avendaño's expedition, December 1695 to January 1696. Franciscan Andrés de Avendaño left Mérida on the 13th of December 1695 and arrived in Nojpetén around the 14th of January 1696, accompanied by four companions. From Chuntuki, they followed an Indian trail that led them past the source of the San Pedro River and across steep karst hills to a watering hole by some ruins. From there they followed the small Acte River to a Chakan Itza town called Sakalmakal. They arrived at the western end of Lake Petén Itza to an enthusiastic welcome by the local Itza. The following day, the current A.J. Khan Ek traveled across the lake with 80 canoes to greet the visitors at the Chakan Itza port town of Niche, on the west shore of Lake Petén Itza. The Franciscans returned to Nojpetén with Khan Ek and baptized over 300 Itza children over the following four days. Avendaño tried to convince Khan Ek to convert to Christianity and surrender to the Spanish crown, without success. The king of the Itza, cited Itza prophecy and said the time was not yet right. On 19 January a Cowage, the king of the Kovoy, arrived at Nojpetén and spoke with Avendaño, arguing against the acceptance of Christianity and Spanish rule. The discussions between Avendaño, Khan Ek and a Cowage exposed deep divisions among the Itza. Khan Ek learned of a plot by the Kovoy and their allies to ambush and kill the Franciscans, and the Itza king advised them to return to Mérida via Tipuj. The Spanish friars became lost and suffered great hardships, including the death of one of Avendaño's companions, but after a month wandering in the forest found their way back to Chuntuki, and from there returned to Mérida. <laughs> Battle at Chaich, 2 February 1696 By mid-January Captain Garcia de Paredes had arrived at the advance portion of the Camino Real at Chuntuki. By now he only had 90 soldiers plus laborers and porters. Captain Pedro de Zubior, Garcia's senior officer, arrived at Lake Petén Itza with 60 musketeers, two Franciscans, and allied Yucatec Maya warriors. They were also accompanied by about 40 Maya porters. They were approached by about 300 canoes carrying approximately 2,000 Itza warriors. The warriors began to mingle freely with the Spanish party and a scuffle then broke out, a dozen of the Spanish party were forced into canoes, and three of them were killed. 
At this point the Spanish soldiers opened fire with their muskets, and the Itza retreated across the lake with their prisoners, who included the two Franciscans. The Spanish party retreated from the lake shore and regrouped on open ground where they were surrounded by thousands of Itza warriors. Zubior ordered his men to fire a volley that killed between 30 and 40 Itzas. Realizing that they were hopelessly outnumbered, the Spanish retreated towards Chuntuki, abandoning their captured companions to their fate. Martin de Ursua was now convinced that Khan Ek would not surrender peacefully, and he began to organize an all out assault on Nojpeden. Work on the road was redoubled, and about a month after the battle at Chaich, the Spanish arrived at the lake shore, now supported by artillery. Again a large number of canoes gathered, and the nervous Spanish soldiers opened fire with cannons and muskets. No casualties were reported among the Itza, who retreated and raised a white flag from a safe distance. Topic. Expedition from Verapaz, February to March 1696 Oidor Bartolomé de Amezqueta led the next Guatemalan expedition against the Itza. He marched his men from Cajabon to Mopan, arriving on 25 February 1696. On 7 March, Captain Díaz de Velasco led a party ahead to the lake. He was accompanied by two Dominican friars and by Icaizao, and it's a nobleman who had been taken prisoner on Díaz's previous expedition. When they drew close to the shore of Lake Petén Itza, Icaizao was sent ahead as an emissary to Nojpetén. Díaz's party was lured into an Itza trap and the expedition members were killed to a man. The two friars were captured and sacrificed. The Itza killed a total of 87 expedition members, including 50 soldiers, two Dominicans, and about 35 Maya helpers. Amesqueta left Mopan three days after Diaz and followed Diaz's trail to the lakeshore. He arrived at the lake over a week later with 36 men. As they scouted along the south shore near Nojpetan, they were shadowed by about 30 Itza canoes and more Itzas approached by land but kept a safe distance. Amesqueta was extremely suspicious of the small canoes being offered by the Itza to transport his party across to Nojpetan. As nightfall approached Amesqueta retreated from the lakeshore and his men took up positions on a small hill nearby. In the early hours of the morning he ordered a retreat by moonlight. At San Pedro Martir he received news of an Itza embassy to Mérida in December 1695, and an apparent formal surrender of the Itza to Spanish authority. Unable to reconcile the news with the loss of his men, and with appalling conditions in San Pedro Martir, Amesqueta abandoned his unfinished fort and retreated to Guatemala. Topic. Assault on Nojpetan The Itzas continued resistance had become a major embarrassment for the Spanish colonial authorities, and soldiers were dispatched from Campeche to take Nojpetan once and for all. Martín de Urzúa y Arizmendi arrived on the western shore of Lake Petén Itza with his soldiers on 26 February 1697, and once there built the heavily armed Galeata attack boat. The Galeata carried 114 men and at least five artillery pieces. The Piragua longboat used to cross the San Pedro River was also transported to the lake to be used in the attack on the Itza capital. On 10 March a number of Itza and Yalan emissaries arrived at Chaich to negotiate with Ursúa. Khan Ek then sent a canoe with a white flag raised bearing emissaries, who offered peaceful surrender. Ursua received the embassy in peace and invited Khan Ek to visit his encampment three days later. On the appointed day Khan Ek failed to arrive, instead Maya warriors amassed both along the shore and in canoes upon the lake. A waterborne assault was launched upon Khan Ek's capital on the morning of 13 March. Ursua boarded the Galeata with 108 soldiers, two secular priests, five personal servants, the baptized Itza emissary Ichin and his brother-in-law and an Itza prisoner from Nojpetan. The attack boat was rowed east towards the Itza capital. Halfway across the lake it encountered a large fleet of canoes spread in an arc across the approach to Nojpetan. Ursua simply gave the order to row through them. A large number of defenders had gathered along the shore of Nojpetan and on the roofs of the city. Itza archers began to shoot at the invaders from the canoes. Ursua ordered his men not to return fire but arrows wounded a number of his soldiers. One of the wounded soldiers discharged his musket and at that point the officers lost control of their men. The defending Itza soon fled from the withering Spanish gunfire. The city fell after a brief but bloody battle in which many Itza warriors died. The Spanish suffered only minor casualties. The Spanish bombardment caused heavy loss of life on the island, the surviving Itza abandoned their capital and swam across to the mainland with many dying in the water. 
After the battle the surviving defenders melted away into the forests, leaving the Spanish to occupy an abandoned Maya town. Martín de Ursúa planted his standard upon the highest point of the island and renamed Nojpetan as Nuestra Señora de los Remedios y San Pablo, Laguna del Itza, Our Lady of Remedy and Saint Paul, Lake of the Itza. The Itza nobility fled, dispersing to Maya settlements throughout Petén. In response, the Spanish scoured the region with search parties. Khan Ek was soon captured with help from the Yalan Maya ruler Chamak Xulu. The Kovoy king AJ Kovoy was also soon captured, together with other Maya nobles and their families. With the defeat of the Itza, the last independent and unconquered native kingdom in the Americas fell to the European colonizers. Topic. See also. Index of Mexico-related articles. Yucatan Topic Notes Topic Citations Topic References Topic Further reading <references>